Beat the clock. Around the clock. Against the clock. Clock in. Carry the day. Once in a blue moon. From now on. In the long run. Year in, year out. A month of Sundays. The hour of need. Now or never. The moment of truth. Better late than never. Make my day. Here today, gone tomorrow. A blink of the eye. Days are numbered. What do all these expressions have in common? Time. We say long time no see. Killing time. Wasting time. Behind the times. On time. Just in time. As time goes by. The nick of time. Do time. Serve time. A whale of a time. Save time. Good time. Ahead of time. No time to lose. The big time. High time. Time is money. Time flies. Crunch time. Out of time. Time for a change. Time's up. I counted over a hundred expressions for time, but they all have one thing in common. They all refer to chronological or sequential time. In our Gospel reading today, Jesus teaches us a new one. Kairos time. The word kairos is Greek for opportunity or the right time or the fullness of time, the supreme moment. In the Bible, kairos refers to God's timing. In his very first sermon, Jesus said, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Mark 1.15 This was a kairos moment for those who heard Jesus. And for the Christ follower, as for Jesus, chronos time and kairos time intersect every moment of every day because we live in two worlds, in time and in eternity, in heaven and on earth. The evening of Maundy Thursday was one of those Kairos moments for Jesus and his disciples. I invite you to turn with me to John 13 and let us discover three things about this Kairos time. What Jesus knew, what Jesus did and what Jesus expects. First of all, what Jesus knew. Our reading from John 13, 1 to 3. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own, who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Three things were told about what Jesus knew. Jesus knew the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father, it says, verse 1. He knew he was rapidly approaching the most important moment of his life, his destiny from eternity past. He knew that the pain, the shame and the agony of the cross was before him. So here's the question for you and I. If you knew that you were going to die tomorrow, what would you do differently today? I'd spend more time with my family. I'd write some short letters to my mother, my brother and the children too far to visit. I'd make sure my will was in order. Not Jesus. Fully God, fully man, Jesus is facing something we cannot imagine. He doesn't say to the disciples, don't you care about what I'm facing? His focus is not on himself. He's concerned that they be prepared for what's about to happen. Jesus focuses on them. Jesus knew the time. 
Second thing Jesus knew, he knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. That's verse 2. Jesus knew who he was. Jesus was the Lord, is the Lord of the universe. If anyone didn't have to humble themselves to wash the feet of farmers and fishermen, he didn't. But because he knew that he was Lord of the universe, he took up the towel and the basin and stooped to fulfil the role of a foreign slave, to do for them what they were unwilling to do for each other or for him. Are we as secure in our position as children of God? Can we serve without feeling service is in any way demeaning? Do we place serving our brothers and sisters among our greatest privileges? Jesus knew the time. He knew who he was. But something else he knew, verse 11, he knew who was going to betray him. Judas, full of deceit, full of hypocrisy, is about to stab Jesus in the back. And Jesus knows it. But what does Jesus do? What would I do? Being stabbed in the back is not that uncommon, but what would you do if you knew it was coming? Some people's motto is, do unto others before they do unto you, but not Jesus. Jesus doesn't distance himself from Judas. Jesus doesn't point the finger at Judas. He doesn't say, how dare you, after all I've done for you. Instead, Jesus loves him to the end. He does everything possible to bring Judas to repentance. He washes his feet with the same tenderness and affection that he gives the other disciples. Maybe that will soften Judas's heart, but it doesn't. He comments on the pending betrayal, verse 10, that all are not clean. Here's another opportunity for Judas to repent. But instead of repenting, Judas hardens his heart. Verse 26, it says, Jesus dipped the bread in the dish and gave it to Judas and exposed him as the traitor. And that was Judas's final opportunity to repent. Opportunity after opportunity, had been resisted. Satan enters him and Judas leaves to do his evil deed. Jesus knew his betrayer. We learn something about Jesus in all of this. We learn something about how he would have us deal with those who betray us too. No resentment, no anger, no bitterness, only sorrow for the awful decision Judas has made and the terrible consequences that will follow. Can you wash the feet of your enemies? Will you serve a person knowing it won't be reciprocated? This is what Jesus knew. He knew his time, he knew his father, and he knew his betrayer. Let's notice, secondly, what Jesus did. What Jesus did. This is in verses 4 to 5. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. I imagine there were a few open mouths, some wide eyes and hushed conversations as one by one the disciples realised what Jesus was doing for them. So without saying a word, he gives them a lecture. Isn't that the best way we learn our most vivid lessons? Notice the action words in verses 4 and 5. He got up from the meal. He left his comfort zone. He made his body do something that it may not have wanted to do. My alarm went off at 6.30 this morning. My body did not want to get up. After a lengthy discussion with my body, it got up. To be a servant, you have to first get up. And Jesus got up. But secondly, Jesus took off his outer clothing. 
To serve others, we usually have to lay something aside. Most of us have a very full schedule of activity. Every servant has to deny themselves something to have the time and the energy to give to others. Jesus got up. He acted. Jesus took off his outer clothing. And thirdly, Jesus wrapped a towel around his waist after he poured water into a basin. You see, he made preparations to meet the needs that no one else was willing to supply. And then it says he began. I like that. At some point, we too have to begin. We, ha we can think about serving. We can pray about serving. We can prepare for serving. But at some point, we've got to start. At some point, you have to start fulfilling your calling, fulfilling your destiny. And notice how Jesus' behaviour is described at the end of verse 1. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. Some translations say the full extent of his love. The term is also used to describe Jesus' position on the cross, his arms open wide. In washing their feet, Jesus was stretching his arms open wide. Later in John 15, verse 13, Jesus says, Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. That's what Jesus did for the disciples. And that's what Jesus has done for you and me too. The time for service is now. The time for service is now. We've looked at what Jesus knew and what Jesus did. And then thirdly, what Jesus taught. What Jesus taught. We find this in John 13, verses 12 to 17. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. John 13, 12 to 17. Jesus begins with a very profound question. Do you understand what I have done for you? Do you? It goes way beyond just getting your feet washed. It goes way beyond just getting our needs met. Jesus comes into our lives he loves us. He receives us. He meets our needs. And sometimes people think that's all that it's about. Getting my needs met. Getting my feet washed. No. It's about a personal transformation of our character and our worldview and our destiny. It's about becoming a servant like Jesus. John 13 verse 15, Jesus explains the reason he's done this. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. This is the heart of the Christian faith. This is central to the Christian walk. In my experience in God is only, if my experience of God is only about me, about me getting my needs met, I've missed the whole point. If church is just about me getting what I want, I've missed something because the greatest human tragedy is for a person to never receive Christ and experience his forgiveness. But the second greatest tragedy is that a person would experience Christ, experience his love, his grace, but never pass that on in word or deed to others. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Four Loves, talks about this very danger. 
Quote, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The only place outside heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers of love is hell. In verse 14, Jesus directly and specifically tells the disciples what the point of his actions are. Now that I, he says, your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. What does Jesus expect of us on Maundy Thursday? That we wash one another's feet. What does that mean? It means doing whatever it takes to meet the needs of those we encounter. Especially those within and through our church family. Before she died, Mother Teresa visited Phoenix to open a home for the poor. During that brief visit, she was interviewed by uh, a local radio station. In a private moment, the announcer asked Mother Teresa if there was anything he could do for her. He was expecting her to request a contribution or media attention to help to raise money for the new home for the needy in Phoenix. Instead, she said, yes, there is. Find somebody nobody else loves and love them. Find somebody nobody else loves and love them. How? Well, remember that you're serving Jesus. Remember you are serving Jesus. You see, we were created to serve. We've been gifted to serve. We've been shaped to serve. And here we are commanded to serve. That's what Maundy means. It means command. My command is this, that you love one another as I have loved you. If you need some more motivation, Jesus promises at the end of this encounter in the upper room, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Verse 17. What a promise. What a privilege. The Apostle Paul understood this well in Philippians 2. He tells us, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. May God humble us all today of all days.